appreciate that very much. Take your Bibles this morning. Let's turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 16. John, chapter 16. We had an exciting day at church yesterday. In the morning, we had our men's prayer breakfast. We had a good number turn out for that. It was always wonderful to hear the men of the church praying together. Being a part of that. I was just thinking about yesterday. I was here, and it just seemed like there was a lot of activity going on. And it was exciting. We had some people here cooking breakfast, and then we had some people here participating, eating the breakfast. That was wonderful. <laughs> and, uh, and then praying together. But after that, there was some work that went on here. Some people were working on computers, and some people were cutting grass, and some people were digging holes for a new shrub that went out, to the, out here. We moved a piano, and it was just good to see God's people all working together without too much arguing or fighting. Um, that he got into it a little bit. So <laughs> Uh, they put a new shrub out here and they got it all planted and looking nice and then Becky says, uh, could you move it six inches to the right? Uh, can you turn it this way? And we shut the door, but I'm pretty sure they were not saying nice things about Becky at that point. And, uh, but, uh, no, other it was a good day. And just, I love seeing God's people working together. Uh, it's just a sweet yeah. spirit. And I appreciate all those who participated yesterday and whatever your role, role was and what a blessing that was. And... Uh, Today we're in John chapter 16. We took a break last week from our study through John's Gospel. And I've been in over a year now. And I saw some of my old notes the other day. It was last fall that we started this. And uh, so we've been in it now for some time with a break here and there. Uh, but we are, as you know, uh, in that the night before Jesus would be taken and the passion of Christ would begin. It is trial. The false trial, his false accusations, and, and his sentencing, and then the beatings, and then the uh, the crucifixion. And so we're the night before, and, and in chapters 13, 14, 15, and 16, Jesus is spending this time with his disciples, uh, and he's encouraging them, and he's working with them. And so here you have this book that covers about a three and a half year period, and, and then you have four chapters that cover one night. So a lot of details in this one evening. And as we mentioned, chapter 15, the Lord is telling us what to do. But in chapter 16, the Lord's telling us what God's going to do for us. And uh, primarily reminding us and giving us the promise that the Holy Spirit would come. Well, we're in verse number uh, 16 this, this morning, and we'll read down through verse number uh, 24. And so follow along with me as we get our context today, and then we'll share some thoughts with you from this passage today. John 16, verse 16. A little while, and ye shall not see me. And again a little while, and ye shall see me, because I go to the Father. Then said some of his disciples among themselves, What is this that he saith unto us? A little while, and ye shall not see me. And again a little while, and ye shall see me. And because I go to the Father. They said, therefore, what is this that he has said, that he saith, a little while, we cannot tell what he saith. Now Jesus knew that they were desirous to ask him, and said of him, Do ye inquire among yourselves that I said, a little while, and ye shall not see me, and again a little while, and ye shall see me. Verily, verily, I say unto you that ye shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice, and ye shall be sorrowful, but your joy Excuse me, but your sorrow shall be turned into joy. A woman, when she is in travail, has sorrow because her hour is come. But as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish for joy that uh, a man is born into the world. And ye now therefore have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no man taketh from you. And in that day ye shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. Hitherto have ye asked nothing in my name. Ask, and ye shall receive, that your joy may be full. Let's pray together for a moment here. Father, I pray now that you just be with us this, this most important part of our day as we look into your precious holy word. Father, we're so grateful to have a copy of the word of God, which can guide and direct us and and teach us, and, and uh, Lord, keep us out of trouble, and, and, and educate us, and inform us, Lord. And Lord, that's what we need today. We need you to speak to us through your word. I pray that you guide correct my words, help me not to say anything that I shouldn't say, to only be uh, where you want me to be today, God. Uh, 
Thank you for what you accomplish in this time. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. As we have studied this passage of scripture, we've mentioned time and again uh, the depression that we can sense and see, or see and feel amongst the disciples as they are coming to grips with what Jesus is telling them. I'm leaving you. Here's this man that they have recognized as their rabbi, as their teacher, as their Messiah. And now he's leaving them. And they did not have a full comprehension of this. And so there's a, there's a depression, there's a uh, turmoil amongst them. Uh, Jesus can see it. Uh, we can hear it in their tone. We can see it in the way they're responding throughout this passage of Scripture, throughout these four chapters. You know, when we're in a trial, it's often a bearable thing or a bearable trial when we can see light at the end of the tunnel. When you look there and say, I'm going through this now, but I know it's going to get better down there. Would you agree with me? Hey. Uh, we can get through it when we see the end in sight. Um, several years ago, um, back, I don't know, well, let me just give you a little history of Mark Carpenter. I grew up in a South Stand Up, if you will. I pretty much looked like this until I was about 25 years old, right? Just look at these muscles he's got there. there. This is my son, and, and that's, he got it for me. Uh, you know, uh, I just was a, we were both a frail frame there. And uh, uh, I was, uh, he's a good looking boy, I understand that. And, and he does 50 push ups, he can do them right now. He's very strong, he's wiry, we call that. You know, that's kind of like Marty Fife, you know. In, in the outside, that's what, I was the same way, and uh, I did not really mean this to be a slam on my side at all. I was trying to get me where I was, but when I hit about 34, 35, something changed in me. And uh, I remember one day my belt just did not fit the way it used to. My pants, I go suck in my belly to get on the button there, and so on and so forth. And I started putting on weight. I guess my metabolism finally slowed down, and and uh, and, and I, I started putting on this weight. And at some point, maybe, I don't know how many years ago it was, six, seven years ago, it came to the point where I really, I had to go on a diet. Uh, I, my brother was like, I'm not buying you any more pants, all right, or any more, no more big, you got to go on a diet. So I went on my first and only diet that I've ever been on. I needed to lose about 15 or 20 pounds. And we had a man in our church in Pennsylvania that had been on the, uh, the South Beach diet. And he had lost over 100 pounds on a truck driver, and so he had put on a lot of weight. And he didn't, wasn't in good health. He said, I'm just going to go on this diet. And he did really remarkably well and, and lost so much weight and, and really became a way of life for this man. And, and so I said, hey, Steve, you know, i, I got to lose about 15, 20 pounds. And I don't know what to do. And he says, oh, Pastor, and he gave me the book. He gave me the plan. And I started going through that. And, uh, you know, and it wasn't a real hard diet. There was a lot of things that I liked that I was still allowed to eat. But it was very frustrating that there were some things I was not allowed to eat. And those weren't things that I was necessarily all that crazy about prior to that time. But when I wasn't allowed to have it, <laughs> that was kind of, you know, it, I started to crave those things. One of those things was mashed potatoes. Mm -hmm. I, I couldn't believe it. I, 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 I didn't have a, a, a phobia of them. I didn't dislike them before. But when I wasn't allowed to have them, oh, did I crave them. And Rachel found this recipe. Oh, we could smash up um, cauliflower, and it's just like mashed potatoes. No, it's not. Not even close. It might look white, but it doesn't even taste anywhere close to it. Rachel would eat it. Mmm, these are good. I said, I'm not some baby you're trying to convince that smash potatoes are good. Mmm, -hmm, you know. And she doing a little airplane thing to me. Come on, Mark. Now, I wanted nothing to do with that. Well, as I was on my diet for several weeks there, I'm, I'm losing weight, it's working. And at some point, I knew I was going to hit my goal. And I told my wife, as soon as I hit my goal, I'm done. I'm off this. I'm not going to continue. I'm done. And, uh, and, and it worked out that it was on a Sunday that I hit my goal. So Sunday night after church, I said, this is, this is going to be good. You know what I did Sunday night after church? I made mashed potatoes. That's all I made. I just got me some potatoes, I boiled them, I put a bunch of butter on them, and, I, and man, I just started eating those. You know what else I did that Sunday night? I drove 30 minutes and went to Taco Bell, all right? I, I just, I, I wanted, and I remember at some point as I was on this journey, this this trial, if I could call it that, there, I could see life in it. There was times I was miserable in it. 
But then I started seeing there's hope, there's light, there's something I can reach to. Now I tried to make a little bit of a foolish and humorous story to give you the understanding of how we can see down our journey here sometimes, our trials, and see there's light at the end of the tunnel. And I can get through this. Yeah. I can make it through this. Um, Peggy Dillman, uh, sweet lady in our church, she had surgery Friday. I went in there, and I don't know how old Peggy is, and I'm not going to dare make a guess today, but you know, she's lived many years, and she's never had surgery before. Nothing. Her That, that IV she got her hand was the first time she'd ever had an IV. I said, you're kidding me. She said, I've given blood before, Pastor, but I've never, I've never had an IV or anything. And so I'm in there, and we're talking, and she goes, I don't even know what to expect. She's giggling and stuff. She goes, I don't even know what to expect with all this. And, 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 and I can tell, and I said, are you a little bit? She goes, yeah, but I know it's going to be okay. She was looking to the future. She was looking out there. There was hope. There was something that she was looking beyond uh, herself here, and she knew that she was going to get through this. Well, today, as we've mentioned time and time again through this, we know trials are a reality in this life. Verse 33 of that chapter, look at that, John 16, verse 33. I'll paraphrase if you read it there. In this world ye shall have many tribulations. If it were not so, I would have told you. Jesus reminds his disciples, in this world, we're going to have difficulties. We're going to have trials. But I want us to bring, get grab hold of this today. For the Christian, there's always light at the end of the tunnel. Amen. There's always hope Amen. that we can look out and we can grab onto and have that reality in our lives. We don't have to, to worry about what's going to, how it's going to end. We know there's hope for us. Hope is an expectation. It's a confidence that we have. You know, sometimes we might use the word hope in our context, in our English language. Now. I, I hope I get it. Like maybe you're watching the football games. I hope they score a touchdown. Or I hope that batter gets a hit. We might use it in a, an almost a cross your fingers type of way. But in the Bible, it's an expectation. It's a, it's a confidence that we can have. And look, look at some verses with me here. Hold your place in John chapter 16. Let's look at some more verses over the Old Testament considering this word hope. Look with me to you, Proverbs chapter number 13. Proverbs chapter number 13. And notice with me verse number 12. The, the, the Solomon writes this considering this in verse number 12. It says, Hope deferred maketh the heart sick. But when the desire cometh, there's a tree of life. Notice that first part, hope deferred. And that word deferred means removed. When there is no hope, it maketh the heart say. And so to have no hope is a, is a sickening feeling. To not have that, um, that confidence and so forth. Uh, is there a man that went, went through a greater trial on this earth than the man Job? Uh, let's consider some of the things that Job said when he was in those darkest times of his life. Look at Job chapter 7. Not understanding fully what was going on. Trying to trust the Lord. But notice what he said as his confidence uh, sometimes wavered. In Job chapter number 7, verse number 6. He says, My days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle and are spent without hope. Uh, look at chapter 17 of the book of Job. And in verse number 15, Job 17, verse 15, And where is now my hope? As for my hope, who shall see it? Look at chapter 19 and verse number 10. He hath destroyed me on every side, and I am gone, and my hope hath been removed like a tree. And we won't take the time today, we can go to the end of the book of Job and find out that Job's hope was a reality that he did find it, and the Lord gave him uh, these things, and it was a real uh, faith building time in his life. Hope. Look at one more verse would be in the Old Testament. Psalm chapter 42. Psalm chapter number 42, verse number 5. It says, Why art thou cast down, O my soul, and why art thou disquieted in me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. That's where I'd like to get us today as we, as we study this passage of Scripture, we consider these things. Hope thou in God. Put your hope, put your confidence, put your assurance, your expectation in God. 
We know this of God. He is the God of all comforts. Look with me to 2 Corinthians. Let's go back to the New Testament now. 2 Corinthians chapter number 1. 2 Corinthians chapter number 1. Verses 3 and 4. It says, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. Look at chapter number 7 of 2 Corinthians. In verse number 6. 2 Corinthians 7, verse 6. Nevertheless, God that comforteth those that are cast down comforted us by the coming of Titus. Let me share one more passage of Scripture before we go back to John 16. Uh, look with me in 1 Peter, chapter number 1. 1 Peter, chapter number 1. Verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Peter is writing to the Jews that have been scattered abroad because of persecution. They've had to flee home. They've had to flee their, uh, their, their regions that they were from and go to these other places because of persecution. He calls them the strangers scattered. Verse 2, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto the obedience of it, and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you, and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively, what's that word? Hope, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. You know where we get our hope today? It's from the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, the very gospel itself gives us hope today. Notice what he says here. This is the hope we have. To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. Listen, we have the reality of an inheritance today that is heaven is our home. That is our hope. Uh, even if in this world we were to, to not make it, we were to die, or when we die, uh, for the Christian, this is not the end. This is not what we've been uh, putting all our, our marbles with here. We have an inheritance for us reserved in heaven for us. He continues on, who are kept by the power of God through faith and salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Wherein ye greatly rejoice till now for a season, if need be ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations. And that word temptations there is the same word for trials or tribulations, difficulties. That the trial of your faith being much more precious than the gold, that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, who having not seen ye love, and whom though now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Listen today, I want us to know this today, that we have a living hope. We have a lively hope, and it's the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So for the Christian today, we have hope. We have a comfort that can only come through Jesus Christ. Now in John chapter 16, here's what I want us to see. We see the trial that is placed before the, these, these men once again in verse number 16. Notice the trial with me again. John 16, verse 16. A little while, and ye shall not see me. And again, a little while, and ye shall see me, because I go to the Father. Now, this was not the first time that Jesus had shared this with his disciples, the reality of his death. But also, he has told them many times of his resurrection. We won't take time to look at all these verses, but if you want to write them down, you can look at a later time. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 39 and 40. Matthew chapter 16, verse 21. Matthew chapter 20, verse 19. Mark chapter 8, verse 31. Mark chapter 9, verse 31. Luke chapter 9, verse 22. Luke 18, 33. John chapter 2, verses 18 through 22. Jesus has said, yes, I'm going to die. I'm going to be crucified one day, but I'm also going to be resurrected. I'm also going to live again. 
Jesus says it again here in John 16. Yet a little while ye shall not see me. And then again, ye shall see me. He's making this statement. And for the disciples, it was hard for them to comprehend and hard to understand. They, they grasp that you're leaving. We see that from the reaction, from the response. We see them in this. But they missed that point. That I'm coming again. That I'll rise again. That passage of scripture in John chapter 2 verses 18 through 22. Jesus is speaking there to the, to the Jews. And, and, and the Jews are talking to him. And, and Jesus says, uh, he goes, you build, you tear down this temple. And in three days it will come back. And they look at the great temple. They said, it took 46 years to build this. And you're going to bring it back in three days? Well, they missed the reality of what he was talking about. He was talking about his temple, his body. Right. Yes, you're going to take this temple down. It's going to be crucified. I'm going to die. I'm going to be buried. And in three days, I will come back. Amen. Praise the Lord. We have that reality today. But that was the trial, the tribulation they were going through. Jesus is leaving. And they missed the hope. They did not have it. And so Jesus wants to give them this hope here in this passage of Scripture. We see their trial, verse 16, but notice now the hope that Jesus gives them in verses 17 through 19. It begins in 17 with the disciples discussing them amongst themselves. What does this mean? What is he talking about? Look at verse 18. They said, therefore, what is this that he saith? A little while, we cannot tell what he saith. Now Jesus knew that they were desirous to ask him, and said unto them, Do ye inquire among yourselves of that I said? A little while, and ye shall not see me. And again a little while, ye shall see me. Jesus gives them some, some hope here. He gives them uh, some light at the end of their tunnel. You're going to see me again. Yeah. You ever get sick of what's going on in the world we're living in today? Amen. Man, you ever get tired of all the things that we have to endure and put up with as Christians? And, and uh, we see some liberties and we see some, some things going on that were being taken away from us. And we see these things and we experience these things. And, and maybe it's difficult to live a Christian life and we get so frustrated with this world. Can I remind you of this, this truth? That Jesus promised us he's coming back again one day. Right. That, that this is all we have to look forward to. In Acts chapter number 1, when Jesus, after his death, burial, resurrection, and he's now ascending up into heaven to leave for good, an angel appeared to those men of Galilee that day. He said this, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus shall so come in like manner as you see them depart from you. Jesus is coming back one day. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 describes it for us. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 describes it for us. We have the hope and the promise of God's word that Jesus Christ is coming back one day for us. We have hope. Peter described it in 1 Peter chapter number 1. John described it for us in the book of Revelation in chapter number 4. Uh, that, that the Lord's coming back one day and we're going to be uh, ushered into heaven with Him at this event known as the rapture. Amen. We recently discussed this in our series of study on Sunday nights. If I know what I believe, but if I know why I believe it. Why? To try to get a greater understanding. We talked about the rapture, the return of Jesus Christ for His saints. And we have the hope. Jesus is sharing with His disciples, I'm leaving, but I'm coming back. Three days later, I'll rise again. Let me, we've already referred to it, but let me remind you what John said. Look at John chapter 2. I, we, I just got done referring to it. But notice John puts a little commentary on it for us in John chapter number 2. And look at verse number 18. Then answered the Jews and said unto him, What sign showest thou unto us, seeing that thou doest these things? Jesus answered and said unto him, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. Now look what John puts in here for us. 
Verse 22. When therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this unto them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus said. In other words, after the resurrection, they're like, that's what he was talking about. This is what he meant. My friends, today I want us to have faith on this side of the return of Christ, that he's coming again. I want us to have the hope and the reality on this side of it. I don't want you to get on the other side and say, oh, he really did come back. And I missed it. Right. I wasn't ready. I wasn't prepared. I want us to be ready and assured on this side of it to have your confidence and your hope in this reality that Jesus is coming again. Jesus here in John chapter 16, he, he gives, we see the tribulation. We see the hope. And then he gives them an illustration or an example of it in verse number 20 and 21. While you're going through that trial. He gives the example in verse 20 and 21 of a, of a lady, a woman in labor. Now I'm going to tread lightly here. Okay? Uh, very tenderly, ladies. Uh, I've never been in labor. Okay? And uh, I certainly don't uh, have a full appreciation of what she went through. But I was with a lady twice watching her go through labor. And I'm going to tread lightly here as well. I'm not sure everything that I was experienced that day, but I know there was great pain and anguish that was involved. I saw my wife hurt in a way that I didn't like. I didn't enjoy. I saw my wife hurt and, and struggle and, and, and ready to give up many times, it seemed like, and, and, and trying to encourage her, you can do this, it's going to be fine. And, and, and through all that But in both instances, at the conclusion, when the baby boy came out, and, and when we got good news and those things, there was sudden joy. I saw my wife's face of anguish, hurt, and fear has now turned to joy, especially when she was able to hold that little child. Amen. You know, sometimes we go through the trials of life. We don't think we're going to get through it. But then there's joy at the end of it. There, there's, there's peace. There's comfort. There's help at the end of it. Notice with me in verse 20. Verily, verily, I say to you that ye shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice. And ye shall be sorrowful. But he says, but your sorrow shall be turned into joy. The trials you're experiencing today, the difficulties we're going through today, we keep our faith, we keep our, our, our eyes on the Lord, we remember the reality of the hope that we have, the comfort that we can receive. There's joy at the end of this. He gives the illustration in verse number 21, the trial, the hope, the illustration of it. And then finally, he gives the promise in verse 22 through 24. And ye now therefore have sorrow, but I will see you again. And your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no man taketh from you. And in that day ye shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say to you, whatsoever ye shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Hitherto ye have asked nothing in my name, and ask, and ye shall receive, that your joy may be full. Notice again verse 22. And now therefore... And ye now therefore have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart shall be choice. What a great promise we have today, just as the disciples did. Just as they said, you'll see me again. We're getting very close to when they're going to see Jesus. We started our study in John chapter number 20 when we started the study. We, we, we jumped ahead. You remember in John chapter number 20 as Jesus and his resurrected body appears to his disciples. And they see him. And all the joy. And then they told one of their members that wasn't there. That's Thomas. We've seen him. And what did Thomas say? I'm not going to believe it unless I can touch the, the, the prince in his hands. And I can see him with my eyes. I'm not going to believe it. And just a day or two later, Jesus appears to him again. And he says, here I am, Thomas. Remember what Thomas said? Lord, I believe thou art the Son of God. Uh, 
my Lord and my God, he said. And today, on this side of that, we can say, I believe. I've got hope. I, I've got light at the end of my tunnel. You know this, that on the other side of this, there's going to be great joy. Great joy on the other side of the trial. I want to encourage us today to keep looking out there to see that light, to see the hope that we have through Jesus Christ. Many people give up in the midst of a trial. Many people quit during the midst of a trial, and they're never able to experience their joy at the conclusion. Heard of a young man the other day that passed away. I don't know. I heard about him. Passed away. He was 30 some years old. And I was reading his obituary, and in his obituary it said uh, he was preceded in death. And there were some people that you would expect that he was preceded in death by, maybe some grandparents, those type of things, but also by twin sons. I just thought, oh my, this family. Going through a, they've gone through a lot. Not only are they burying a, a husband and a father, they've already had to bury twin sons. And the family, as he was dying, they said in the obituary, they stood around his hospital bed. And they were holding hands. His mom and dad were there, brothers, sisters, his wife, and the family, all who were there. And they were singing, and said his grandfather's favorite song. The sun's coming up in the morning. You may know that song or may not know that song. The idea is of the trials we go through, the difficulties we go through. But you know what? The sun's coming up in the morning. There's nothing. We may not see it because of the clouds of our trials, but it's coming up. It's there. And that family had a confidence and an assurance, even though they were saying goodbye to their loved one, the sun's coming up in the morning. And I want to encourage us today in the midst of our trials, don't lose sight. Don't lose hope. Keep your eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ. Know this. The sun's coming up in the morning. And there's joy at the end of this trial. Great joy. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me today?